Ahmad Hussain Imran Zahab, Professor Ramzad Hussain, Professor Mir Izahul Karim, Professor Nurul Islam, our guest from across the border, Sir Kanzakar Mahmood Hussain, Sir Qazi Sharif, Dr. Abdul Mateen, dignitaries around the dais, colleagues and friends. I have a question about Bangladesh and Niger Prostiti Ragbo, but I have to listen to Bangladesh and our self-confidence, our atomishas, I have to say, and our Kolkata, 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 and our Bangladesh, and our Kolkata, and our Kolkata, but as I have to say, I have to say, I have to say, I have to say, so this is a serious issue that we have to say, अपनी आप दर मनोरंजन खोराक देते चाहिए ना अभी इंग्लिश ते निजेर प्रस्तुति रखी। I was really honoured and privileged to be invited to this very serious discussion on issues, which is an international and also interdisciplinary seminar with a strong contingent from across the border, from Bangladesh, the country of my origin. I was looking forward to really understanding a lot more about the social and cultural dimensions because as students of economics I get confined to the economic areas but unfortunately it's a personal tragedy at home I have to rush back immediately after this session. You know a sick friend of mine, a Sadaf friend told me once in Delhi and there is some similarity between Bengalis and the Sikhs. He said, like a Sikh, you can take a Bengali out of Bengal, but you can't take Bengal out of Bengali. I recall a young American girl in Philadelphia who was married to a Bengali executive working from, for Accenture. She said, I went to my husband's office in Philadelphia. There are 50 Bengali young boys and girls working in that company. And she said, I can make them stand in two queues, one supporting East Bengal, other supporting Mohan Bagan, although they are there in America for 15 years. I think there is some truth in that. There is a stamp of the region, the stamp of the language. And quite irrespective of what religion you have, what caste you have, what professional background you have, there is something about the Bengaliness. And that's why I strongly support this idea of looking at Bengali Muslims and looking at the social economic characteristics. Again, there's a humorous kind of a statement somebody said that people from in Calcutta and Dhaka are known, are identified by who you are, whether you are an engineer or a doctor or a professor or a singer or an artist. And they said in Mumbai, people are known by what you are. You are the chairman or managing director or highest officer or upper division clerk or a lower division clerk. In Delhi, they said, you are known by, your importance depends on whom you know. Do you know Kejriwal or you know Mr. Amit Shah? Well, I think the boundary is such. Anecdotal things about Bengal has been really gradually collapsing. But nonetheless, I do believe that there are cultural identities and they leave their impact on the socio-economic characteristics as analyzed by such a committee and also the post such a committee where West Bengal was clearly distinguishable from the rest of the country in terms of the socio-economic characteristics of the Muslim population. My teacher, Professor Amartya Sen, in a very slim volume called Identity and Violence, this 
book was written in a way an answer to Huntington's very famous or infamous book, you know, Clash of Civilization, when he says that the clash between Christianity and Islam is inevitable. And he was really writing this book in anger. But he made a very important point, and I would like our other panelists to look at this thesis. He says, a Muslim can be a top executive, can also be a good musician, can be president of a golf club, can be a member, active member of a civil society organization, can be a very loving husband, excellent family member. But he says that in terms of crisis, when there are communal tensions, all these multiple identities of that Muslim person gets washed out. He's identified as a Muslim. In terms of communal violence, you forget that this person has a large number of personalities and facets, and they all disappear. And I think the point that he's making is that the political parties, which are supposed to be working for the Muslims, for the welfare of the Muslims, they also would like to tell that Muslims must have similar kind of a behavior on global warming, on population control, on decentralization, on Article 370, or on triple talaq, Muslim views should be identical. And similar positions taken by those parties which are working for Hindu fundamentalist group. They say, yes, there should be polarization. Muslims means this. And this, I think, is total caricature of reality. Amartya Sen rightly points out that there are multiple identities and there can be different of views and there are difference of views on very important social political issues. And let's not say this is just one way of looking at the Muslim population. And that's why I think when you talk about Bengali Muslims, you're making one important distinction. Out of these multiple characteristics, I think we should respect that. Multiple views and that is part of Indian culture. It's a part of Bengali Muslims culture. Also, there is no one view on important social political issues. And that's the first point that I would like to convey to you. As the person associated with the post session committee, we had the privilege of being appointed by the UPA government, but we knew there was politics behind it because they appointed the committee when they knew that their term is going to be over in three months' time and the next election was coming. People were not sure that they are coming back to power. On the other hand, people were sure on the other, hand, other side. And we submitted our report to the NDA government. They had not commissioned it. They were not perhaps interested in receiving it, but when we went and submitted it to Madame Nazbahitatullah, she did not know what the report is about. She said, oh, of course, I'm looking forward to it. And after that, all that I've heard in response to some of the questions raised by Imran Saab and also the other leaders in the parliament that Kundu Samiti ka report jo hai, hamara vichara dheen hai, it is under consideration. I haven't heard anything after that, unfortunately. But nonetheless, this is an occasion I would like to just point out some of the socio-economic characteristics of the Bengali Muslims, how it is different and how there are, if you want to have some kind of a integrated strategy of development for the Muslim, Bengali Muslim. You have to look at those nuances. I've talked about the post Sachar Committee report. We have updated the database of Sachar Committee. I've spoken about it in a number of platforms. I use every single opportunity in the television or in the public media to highlight those findings, to bring out the strong deprivation of the Muslim population in education, in employment, in access to credit, in various socio-economic dimensions. And I said, sorry, this needs to be addressed. As a person, I'm not a missionary. I've not been working my, for my life for the Muslim population. No, that's if somebody tells me that, credits me that I said this is wrong, I work on disparities. I work on inequalities. As a student of inequality with Professor Amartya Sen, I started my doctoral work. I just looked at the deprivation and I was shocked at the deprivation that the Muslim communities have in general and also, I'm sorry to say, Muslim communities' deprivation that they have in Bengal. And that has been highlighted by such a committee. And we have also looked at it 
in much a greater depth. Let me point out four or five things as I mentioned that I will return back to Delhi immediately after this. I may not be very coherent. First thing is about demography. Why Bengali Muslim population needs in West Bengal particularly needs emphatic research and the point that was mentioned empirical investigation I think Kazisa was emphasizing on that can we have the first slide please demography is important the total population Muslim population this is I'm sorry I was asking our ex-student Abdul Mateen to update the data by looking at NFHS 4 and some of the NSS reports for West Bengal. I have done this exercise at the national level but as far as the West Bengal state is concerned I am depending largely from secondary sources so you will excuse me. This shows as far as the total population is concerned you can clearly see that West Bengal is at the top. The total Muslim population across the states not you know, not Kerala. It's more or less same as Kerala, but the growth rate of population, Muslim population in Bengal is slightly higher. But as far as the percentage of Muslim population is concerned, you know, Kerala has a lower percentage, you see, but Uttar Pradesh has a slightly higher percentage figure. So I think this is important, and this point was mentioned, that which district in the country has the largest number of Muslim population? It is not Malapuram. It is Murshidabad. Out of 25 districts which have 1 million plus population, 5 of them are in West Bengal. And I think it is extremely important to begin our analysis of the socio-economic conditions by looking at the demography. It was mentioned that percentage of Muslim population in West Bengal is 27%, right, at, at the moment. 2001, the figure was 25%. So there has been an increase in the percentage of Muslim population between 2001 and 11. Why? Obviously, elementary arithmetic, the growth rate of Muslim population has been higher than the growth rate of the other population, right? It's true that the growth rate of Muslim population in the country as a whole is also higher compared to the other population. Percentage of Muslim population in the country has gone up from 13 point something to 14 point something. So there has been an increase there also. The first statistical illusion that comes, if Muslim population in West Bengal has gone up from 25% to 27% and in the national level it has gone up, from 13.5 to 14, 14.5, then Muslim population in West Bengal must be growing at a faster rate than Muslim population in the country as a whole. I'm sorry, that is not correct. You do find that growth rate of population in the country has declined. Population growth rate, we are proud to announce that our population growth rate has gone down. Total fertility rate by NFHS 4 shows a sharp decline for the country as a whole. Total fertility rate for the Muslim population is the highest. It is higher than that of scheduled caste, scheduled tribe population, even in 2017-18. Having said that, I would like to emphatically state, which I wrote in the media, that the decline in the total fertility rate of the Muslim population is the highest. There is a sharp decline in the total fertility rate. It continues still to be slightly higher than SCST fertility rate. But there is a trend towards convergence. You, you look at the provision of elementary education. NFHS 4, National Health Family Survey, shows that the impact of primary education on Muslim fertility is dramatic. Much higher than the impact of primary education on upper caste Hindu population. You find that the total fertility rate of the Muslim woman goes down dramatically with primary education and with primary health facilities. I had a TV discussion with Rakesh Sinha. You might have heard of him. He is a member of Rajya Sabha. And he said, we are, we are, I am not 
talking about Hindus, Muslims, I am talking about reducing total fertility rate. We have identified the districts where total fertility rate is more than 3.5 or 4. It should be ideally to go down to 2.1. That's the stable population requirement. And we are only fo focusing on those districts where total fertility rate is high, irrespective of the religion, religious base. I said, excellent, I am with you, although I know for sure that those districts that you are talking about where total fertility rate is 3.5 has percentage of Muslim population more than 40%. But I accept your argument that we should target to those districts where total fertility rate is high, irrespective of the religious base. But I said, have you looked at the NFHS data to say, how do you bring down the total fertility rate? The maximum impact you can make by to bring down the total fertility rate is primary education. Again, I'm emphasizing, I control in my mathematical model, I control for other factors. You give primary education and primary health facilities, you find total fertility rate of the Muslim population comes down dramatically. And that's the point I try to make in that, yes, I'm with you, let's identify the right factors. Other point that I want to make is that the growth rate, the increase in the percentage from 25 to 27 in case of West Bengal is not because Muslim population in West Bengal, please listen to this statement very carefully because this can be misunderstood. The growth rate of Muslim population in West Bengal is not higher than the growth rate of Muslim population in the rest of the country. It is lower than the growth rate of population in the rest of the country. Muslim population during 2001 and 11 has grown at this. You know, if you take the two, 91 to 2011, you find Muslim population in West Bengal has grown at a slower pace. And yet, 25% has become 27%. Whereas national level, you know, 13 to 14. How come? It's basically because the overall growth rate of population in West Bengal is low. And that's the reason that although the Muslim population growth in West Bengal is less than the national level, but it is higher than the population growth rate in West Bengal. Am I making this point clear? The growth rate of population in West Bengal happily is much less. And despite the fact that the Muslim population in West Bengal is growing at a slower rate than the national level, it is higher than the West Bengal's population growth rate and that's the reason why you find 25% has become 27%. Let's not have statistical nonsense. We look at the data and say yes, there is a possibility of decline but let's identify the right kind of instrumental measures to bring down the total fertility rate. The second point I want to mention again on demography is gender balance. You must be all knowing that female-male ratio shows how the society is treating the woman. And female-male ratio, you know, among the Muslims is higher than that of upper caste Hindus, than scheduled caste, scheduled tribe population. What does it show? Life expectancy of a Muslim woman is two years more than the life expectancy of an upper caste Hindu woman. This is NFHS 4. How come? I mean, I am not a specialist on social discrimination, the status of Muslim women in the household, whether they are allowed to move freely. These are not the issues that I have studied, but I can look at the life expectancy of Muslim women is higher. Why is it so? I mentioned this in Indian General Center in Delhi. There are some, somebody stood says they are not vegetarian food and blah blah blah. And Hindu women observe Shivaratri and all these rituals. These are all peripheral factors. The real reason is infant mortality rate of a girl child in the Muslim household is less than the infant mortality rate for the girl child in the Hindu family. Other factor is that Muslim households have greater access to sanitation facilities. Percentage of Muslim households having access to, I also chair the rural part of Swachh Bharat Mission. We can clearly bring it out that the percentage of Muslim households having access to toilet facilities is higher. Mortality rate is less. But it's also important that under 5 child mortality rate in the Muslim households is less compared to the other communities, which shows that the gender is discrimination. By the way, I'm not saying gender discrimination does not exist. Male preference does not exist in the Muslim households, but it is less than the other communities and that's the reason you find 
zero to six sex ratio, female male ratio, among the Muslims is slightly better, and there has been improvement. And I think West Bengal stands out. You do find that the gender empowerment here. I'm not really saying that this has been done wonders, but slightly better than all India level. The Muslim sex ratio at zero to six in West Bengal is slightly better as compared to the national level. So that's again, Bengal stands out slightly above the national average. But now, the two points I mentioned about population growth rate for the Muslims in Bengal not being say, higher than that of all India and also sex ratio advantage, gender factor in West Bengal, even with the Muslim communities, slightly better than the national level. Is it also true for literacy rate? I'm sorry, that is not true. Come to the education dimension, you do find male, female literacy rate for the West Bengal Muslims are not better than the average of UP, Bihar and Kerala put together. So educational deprivation of the Muslims in West Bengal is certainly a matter of concern. So I do not want to come and tell you all the wonderful things that I have been able to dig out in the last 10-15 days of my own study of West Bengal, but certainly percentage of Muslims having secondary education, completed matriculation is less in West Bengal compared to the All India average. Average years of schooling, I looked at that data, I find for the West Bengal Muslims it is less than the All India average. There is something which is certainly significantly wrong there. The gender factor is still there. Woman, men gap is not as high as in the upper caste Hindu population, but certainly it is quite high. And what worries me, I think the point that Imran Zab, you are making about the middle class disappearing with the partition and other factors. The inequality within the Muslim community is very high. You do find that urban Muslims on an average have a lower level of literacy than the urban Muslims in the country as a whole. Generally, in the other states, urban Muslims are much better than the rural Muslims. Unfortunately, urban Muslims in West Bengal are slightly better than the rural Muslims in West Bengal, but the gap is not that high. Basically because of the refugee population coming in and the urban average tends to be not that high. I'm saying if you compare only the urban Muslims of West Bengal with the urban Muslims in the rest of the country, you do find that the West Bengal does not shine out. So this is a matter of anxiety and the other point, Imran Sahib, you mentioned inequality. Yes, such a committee looked at the job availability and it shows West Bengal, despite the left government and you know, definitely secular perspective that West, the left front government put forward, you find share of Muslims in the government jobs is very low, much less than other states, much less than Bihar Uttar Pradesh. So that's a matter of anxiety which such a commission identified and we investigated into that and we did find that indeed the access to the government jobs, <coughs> state government and central government jobs of the Muslim population in West Bengal is not high, not higher. I mean I do not have the time to show you all the graphs that I have prepared but certainly it's a matter of anxiety and we endorse the view of such a commission that government needs to think seriously about access of the Muslims to the job market. You know, the question is, in the country as a whole, Muslim population in the rural areas are not dependent on land. They are not cultivators. They are outside agriculture. Percentage of Muslims outside agriculture in all other states are very high. But Abdul Mateen did point out that West Bengal situation is different. There, there are many, larger percentage are dependent on land and cultivation, but yet many of them would like to come out in the urban areas and get into the government jobs and non-agricultural employment. That has not happened. That is the unfortunate part and that one needs to address. Look at the access to credits, because for getting non-agricultural jobs for self-employment, you do need 
access to the credit. This is the figure again coming from such a commission report. Have we skipped? Yeah. Just go back to one or two. You see, you do find that private sector advances 14,000 rupees for average family, whereas average of West Bengal is 59,000, much higher. How come Muslim households get such low average lending? Yes, look at Kerala, Kerala 29,000. Well, with Uttar Pradesh is 30,000. And, you know, for the others, you find 60,000 and West Bengal 59,000, more or less the same. But as far as the Muslim households are concerned, the access to credit market is very low. That is one of the reasons why employment diversification among the Bengali Muslims have not taken place. The access to public sector funds have been very low. Go to the earlier one also. There is no, sorry, so go down, go down, go down further, down again. Now this shows, yes, share of Muslims in the deposits. Their share in the deposits is quite high, 12%. It's not as high as in Uttar, uh, as high as Kerala, but 12% is the total share. 25% is the population share in, in 2001. This pertains to 2001. But 12% share in the deposits, so they are putting in money, they are having the accounts all right, but they are not getting the loans. 6% is the loan. 25% population getting 6% of the loans. That certainly is a huge, huge gap. Look at Uttar Pradesh. The share in the deposits is 7%, but the share in the advances, the loans given, is much higher. Even Bihar reports higher figure of advances given by the public sector banks. So obviously the access to the credit for the Bengali Muslims have been very, very low. Please go down to the next one. This is showing consumption expenditure. Again, I looked at the latest data. This is from such a commission. I, I, irrespective of this graphs, which may take some time to settle in, in your mind, let me tell you that urban Muslims are somewhat better off in terms of absolute per capita consumption expenditure, but the poverty level for the urban Muslims in all India level is higher than even scheduled caste and scheduled tribe population. I would like to repeat this. Our calculation with the data for 2011-12 shows that the Muslim poverty in the urban areas is almost similar to that of scheduled tribe poverty or slightly higher than scheduled tribe poverty and it is much higher than the scheduled caste poverty in the urban areas. In the rural areas, overall you find that rural Muslims are slightly better off because they are outside agriculture, they are into non-agricultural employment, carpentry, some machinery, some so they are slightly better off. Poverty is less than scheduled caste, scheduled tribe population. But in the urban areas, scheduled tribe and scheduled caste population have access to reservation. And that improves their average figure. But unfortunately, the Muslim poverty tends to be higher than for other sections of the population. I would like to have some discussion, some questions, because there is a large number of socio-economic characteristics that we have analyzed in the post social committee and also I prepared for this presentation. If there are any specific questions, I would like to respond to that. But there is one area on which I have done some work and I know in the context of West Bengal, we have Dr. Mahalaya Chatterjee here. I saw her coming in. She has also looked at urbanization level. I want to bring out one significant point about the Bengali Muslims and their rates of urbanization. Access to urban space by the Bengali Muslims in West Bengal. Sorry, my analysis is restricted to West Bengal only as far as the data is concerned. I am comparing that with the access of Muslim population to the urban space in the country as a whole. This is from a paper which is just published in a journal Area Development and Policy, published from UK, London. I just want to share the results of that analysis and I will stop at that. We know that access to urban space or 
having larger percentage of people living in urban areas higher access to education is higher access to health facilities is higher nfha shows that you live longer if you are born in an urban area if you live in an urban area despite the pollution that we have in delhi and kolkata the average life expectancy in urban areas is higher than rural areas there are all kinds of deprivations in the rural areas which don't even get highlighted in the media so access to urban space is considered to be a matter of satisfaction is a matter of advantage now let us compare three groups of population scheduled caste scheduled tribe and muslim population which community has greater access to urban employment no, 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 no. urban no, no, no. amenities no, no. urban education no, no. urban educational facilities which community has a larger share in urban areas can we go down can go down yes 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 one more one more one more yeah please stop now i'm talking about exclusionary urbanization in india percentage of scheduled tribe population living in urban areas is much smaller than their share in the total population 7 to 8% scheduled tribe population but what percentage of the tribal population live in urban areas can you see that in this table 2.3% in 1991 So, scheduled tribe population is extremely deprived as far as access to the urban population is concerned. Most of the tribal population live in remote areas in Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, and they don't have access to the urban amenities. In fact, there is a study in the Clark University who shows that if you had your entire education in the rural areas, the possibility that you will get into IITs, IIMs, and the modern education system is zero. irrespective of whether you are a hindu or a muslim or a brahmin or a uh, scheduled caste so access to urban educational facilities is important for getting into the modern jobs and access to the urban health facilities is important for increasing your life expectancy rural life expectancy is 4 or 5 years less than urban life expectancy now you find scheduled tribe population is most deprived and i have calculated one small index percentage of most uh, scheduled tribe living in urban areas divided by overall percentage of scheduled tribe population so that works out to be 0.28 that means the percentage of scheduled tribe population in the country is about four times than the percentage of scheduled tribe living in urban areas urban areas 2.3 divided by something like 7 or 8 and you get a figure of 0.28 this is for the scheduled tribe population this is for scheduled caste population 0.72 which is again less than 1 that means their share in urban space is less than what it should be if there are equal access what about muslims 1.36 percentage of muslim population living in urban areas is more than the share of the muslim population only 14 only 14% of the population of the country is muslims whereas the percentage of muslim population living in urban areas you get my in the numerator you write muslim population living in urban areas divided by total muslim population 40% of the muslim population live in urban areas whereas only 14% of the total population of the country is muslim which means muslim population have an advantage in accessing urban space urban amenities urban employment opportunities that's a very straightforward and elementary conclusion which needs to be examined why is it that percent urban percentage of muslim population is very high because of the mogal empire because of sultanate because of history right because the mogal empire started in the big cities hyderabad you know delhi lucknow so obviously the percentage of muslim population is much larger than the share in the total population so 1. 36 that is the starting point 1991 i have analyzed it this is the paper as i said is published in a london journal it's available online now it's not yet in the print 
But what has happened after that? 0 0.72 has gone up to 0 0.73, 0 0.76. It means that more and more scheduled caste population have moved to the urban areas. The degree of concentration has improved over time, up to 2011. What about scheduled tribe population? 2.2830, 0.32. There has been some improvement in accessing the urban space. What about Muslims? Forget about history. History has placed Muslim population in the urban areas, but if you look at the inequality in the, among the Muslims, it's sharp. There are rickshaw pullers, they're all informal sector, and there are some high-level jobs. In fact, such a committee does bring out the access of Bengali Muslims in the top-level position is somewhat better, slightly higher. Middle class has disappeared, but at the top level there is a... But large percentage of the urban Muslims are in the informal sector. And what has happened over time, I'm sorry I brought this out, 1.36 has gone down to 1.29, it has gone down further, which means access to urban space has become increasingly difficult for the Muslim population, which means rural urban migration for the Muslims have become less over time. And this is a matter of concern. I am not talking about this government or that government because the data does not per permit me to give you the figure for 2017 or 18. I am stopping at 2011 because that's the data that's available. And it does show that the access of the Muslim population in the re recent years have become increasingly difficult. Either because of housing market, there are problems in renting out it, or the labor market discrimination or it's possible that the Muslim rural persons do not have the skills which is required in the urban modern sector. But why not do the skill formation? Why not you give the skills and as I mentioned, a large section of the Muslim population in the rural areas are outside agriculture. They are in the non-agricultural sector. It should be easier for them to pick up the skills and come to the urban areas. But unfortunately, the degree of concentration, the geographers work it out, it shows it has gone down 1.36, 1.29, 1.28. This is from population census, which means overall rate of migration for the Muslims after independence has declined. Can we go? Now, just let me, let me, please look at, look at the bottom figures. Percentage of urban population in India, those who have worked in the urban sector would know, 23.7 went up 25.7, 27.8. There is significant increase. Everybody can read the last bottom two lines? No. Well, uh, I, I have to read it out for you. You do find that rate of a uh, uh, percentage of urban population has gone up from 23.7 to 28%. But percentage of Muslim population in the urban areas, 34.0, 35.5, 35 35.7, it hasn't gone up up to 2001. So percentage of urban population has not a rate of urbanization. I'm not talking about level of urbanization. As far as Muslims are concerned, they are in urban areas because of history. But after independence, you do find access to the urban space has become somewhat difficult. And up to 2001, percentage of Muslim population living in urban areas have not increased much. 34% going up to 35.7%. Not much of an increase, where overall urbanization in the country has gone up significantly, 23.7 to 27.8 percent. But latest census, 2011, shows there's an increase in the percentage of Muslims living in urban areas. That's a good sign, 2001 and 11, because percentage of Muslims in the urban areas has gone up to 40 percent. I did mention that 35.7. And that I was very happy that we find that Muslim population have their share in the urban areas have gone up. But do you know what? Why it is? There are two scholars in West Bengal who really opened my eyes. They looked at the Muslim growth rate of Muslim population in the urban areas. Those of you who work on the urbanization would know that West Bengal has reported a large number of new towns coming up. The number of new towns reported in 2011 census is about 3,000. Out of them, 1,000 plus are in Kerala, and about 1,000, less than 1,000 is in West Bengal. 
And these new, new towns, which are really villages, this is a largely Muslim population. And they have become urban. And these two scholars, I'll just give you the reference, show that these new towns, which were villages in 2001, they have now become urban. They have miserable conditions as far as access to basic amenities are concerned. In fact, Registrar General says that these are worse than slums. So just because you find an increase in the percentage of Muslims in the urban areas, it is not because of migration of the Muslims to big cities or middle towns. It is because of the new towns which have come up, which are actually the large villages that do not have the facilities. And this is a study, very important study, done by two scholars. And if you don't mind my saying, both of them are Hindu scholars. I mean, I think there's a strong secular tradition in this country, which will always win, will come up. And that is what I would like to mention, that access to urban space becoming increasingly less and less for the vulnerable sections of the population. In my paper, which is published in London, I also looked at scheduled caste in two categories. Scheduled caste were Buddhist, who have some Buddhist scheduled caste have some mobilization, Ambedkarite, there is some civil society movement, there are some organizational support, but scheduled caste Hindus, their access to urban is also less, along with the Muslim population. So I do feel that this country is having certainly this communal factors coming in the labor market and the housing market. Whether it is actually discrimination or disparity because of the natural not availability of this skill, right kind of skill, but this is a matter of serious concern and I would like to bring this to the notice of the Ministry of Urban Development. I would like to show you last two graphs. This is for a national sample survey. NSS data shows the same picture. You find that degree of concentration for the SCs in the urban areas have gone up 0.78 to 0.90. 0.41 to 4.2, but for Muslim population, even national sample survey shows that their access to urban space has gone down. Then, the next one, you find rate of migration, 99-2000, shows number of migrants per thousand population. In the rural areas, the lowest figure is for the Muslims. You find Hindus 250, Muslim 189. Christians 231, Sikhs 298. So rural urban migration of the Muslim population in 99-2000 is very low. In the urban areas too, I put it with the red sign. Go to the next one. This is the latest. This is for the 64th round, 2007-8. You find the same story. The rate of migration of the Muslims from the rural to urban areas is the lowest. So that is a matter of concern, which again comes to my mind, not because I am a missionary working for the Muslims. I looked at the data and I do find that the access of the rural Muslims to the urban space has become less and less in recent decades. And would you believe this paper when it is published in London, it has been very well received. And my chief editor tells me, it is well received not because people want to know about India. He said, there is a decline in the migration of the Muslims in the whole of Europe. So this is a major area of concern. So all the social scientists say, oh, if Indian data also is showing that access to urban space for the vulnerable section is becoming somewhat less in recent decades, this is symptomatic. And large number of other research studies are now being commissioned in other European countries to see how the migration, in-migration, international migration of the Muslims population is going to be affected in future years and that certainly is a matter of global concern. I thought I link up this concern of uh, India and of West Bengal to the global concern. The study that I refer to by the two scholars do show that although percentage of Muslim population in the urban West Bengal has gone up, it is basically because of the new towns which are really the large villages. But if you take the old towns and find out the percentage of Muslims, you find that has not gone up. This has gone down by half a percentage point. Which really means that the old towns, there has not been much of migration. It's not because of the migration, because the census has identified a large number of 
big villages as urban and since these big villages had large section of Muslim population, you find percentage have gone up but their access to basic amenities and livelihood opportunities have not improved at all. I just thought that I'll flag some of the issues that come to my mind when I look at the West Bengal's data for the social religious groups in comparison to the national data set. Thank you very much for your patience. At that time in the Muslim, uh, in the cities of West Bengal, very less Muslims were there. Uh, all the cities except Kolkata and Asansol, Muslim, just like Siliguri, just like the capital of Mushidabad, Bahampur, and others, other cities, uh, cities, urban areas, there are very less Muslim compared to uh, other states uh, where Uttar Pradesh or other states, Muslims are there as you say that uh, in a large number, but in West Bengal it was not so. So why it is, uh, can you explain? And it affects our, our uh, all, all, all developments, all the developments it affect, affects. Because uh, for, for uh, study, we have to come to Kolkata or some other cities. For health facilities, we have to come to cities. So the uh, thing is, it is a big factor that Bengali Muslims are uh, lagging behind. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll take, yeah, we'll take two, three. Thank you, Professor Kundu, for an enlightening talk. My question is, when you talk about urban migration, that it's decreased, are you talking about a permanent kind of migration, or are you also looking at contingent migration? Because I have relatives all over Bengal villages, and I know there are villages where you won't find many, you know, teenage boys. They've all left for Mumbai or for some towns or cities in Maharashtra. So going by that, I would say the, the access to urban spaces are really not that bad. I mean, you have to look outside West Bengal. Uh, I'm talking about contingent because they come back. They're kind of seasonal. Sometimes they stay for five years, they'll come back again for two months, they go back, and that's what happens. So I, I just would like to know this a little bit more. Any more? Okay, last question. Thank you for the chance. I want to ask, sir, as you said that, uh, Urbanization of Muslims in metro in big cities. Urbanizations of Muslim in big cities are better for them because they get better health facilities, education facility. But the main problem is that they don't get a better accommodation facility. So the urbanization in this term would be better for them. This is the question I want to ask. Thank you. When you are talking about uh, migration of Muslims in West Bengal, you know in West Bengal big cities like Kolkata, Shanshul, Shiuri, there is a large concentration of Muslims speaking Urdu. Speaking Urdu. They are not the Bengali Muslims. I want to ask, what about the Bengali Muslims? I must admit that the questions are difficult for me to answer because I really have not worked in that great detail on the history of West Bengal. The first question that you asked Imran Sahib, how come in the urban areas in West Bengal, Muslim population was less earlier years? What I have shown, and in fact for West Bengal this is not my work, the study shows that the percentage of Muslims living in the old urban areas, these urban centers which existed in 2001, their percentage of Muslims have gone down the old ones. I'm talking about the recent period, but the overall percentage of Muslim population in the urban areas have gone up because of the new towns which have come up, which have predominantly Muslim population. Now your question is, why is it that West Bengal started 
even at the time of independence, lower percentage of Muslim population as compared to UP. That really depends on the colonial policies of conversion or entering into the rural areas. But I have already mentioned that the Muslims in other states, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, are primarily, you know, outside agriculture. Whereas in West Bengal, Muslims are attached to land. And, and uh, you know, as I'm saying in comparison to All India situation, the percentage of non-agricultural Muslim workers in the rural areas is much higher as compared to West Bengal. And that's why I thought there should be more migration because non-agricultural workers should be able to move to the urban areas. And I know when I mentioned that Muslim migration has gone down, many people, uh, I am also taking the second question together, they said, well, this is not true. Overall migration has gone up. Indeed, Arvind Subramaniam, the economic survey person, showed, and in the chapter is called, you know, moving India and uh, Indian mobility has gone up phenomenally. He looks at the railway movement data and proves that, which has been dismissed by the census organization. But there is no doubt that overall migration during 2001 and 11 has gone up. But, as I said, if you look at the census data and you do find the percentage of Muslims living in the old urban areas, that share has gone down. Now, what could be the reason? I traveled through Mallapuram, some of the districts in West uh, Kerala. I had a project of UNDP trying to find out how Muslims are getting in the informal and formal sector. In Mallapuram, you know, many four or five districts, we did find a large number of Bengalis there. Bengali migrants. Right? And when, when I asked them, they said we are from West Bengal. They mentioned one or two districts. Could be some of them are from Bangladesh. But I don't think that percentage is very high. But nonetheless, there is movement which has taken place which was not there earlier. So I am not saying that inter the migration to the other states from Bengal has not gone up. This certainly has gone up and Muslim migration also has gone up because percentage of Muslim population in West Bengal is 25%. But census data as far as West Bengal is concerned certainly shows that their share has not gone up which means if the Muslim population is migrating, they are migrating to outside the state and going to the other urban areas because census data clearly shows that the rural urban migration within the state of West Bengal has not gone up. But overall in the country also, if you take, forget about West Bengal, you do find rural urban migration among the Muslims have not gone up. Is it because some of the Muslims are declaring themselves to be non-Muslims? I do not know that. But certainly we know for sure that in 2011, a large number of migrants have declared that they have not moved in last 10 years. They have moved for the last 25 years. Because there is hostility in the urban areas. Even the Hindu migrants coming to Bombay from Bihar in Uttar Pradesh, they don't mention that we have come in 2003. They mention we have come in 1992. Why? Because Bombay is hostile to the new migrants. So if people are lying about the year of arrival, they could be lying about their religion also and in Delhi when I did some primary survey I did find the photograph of Kali and Durga in some of the houses which really didn't look to be Hindu household but I'm, I'm simply saying that this kind of a uh, anti-migrant uh, feeling could be there which is forcing people to lie about that and I certainly believe that if at the national level and at the West Bengal level, where official data shows that the Muslim migration from rural to urban areas have not gone up, there are seasonal migration, which is true. And census, unfortunately, does not cap capture. I'm just basing on the large national level data. But there can be some pockets where massive migration has taken place. But overall data do not confirm that rural urban migration has gone up tremendously. It has gone up slightly, but we do find that the vulnerable sections of the population 
which includes scheduled caste Hindu population and Muslim population, their migration rate has certainly not increased over time. And as far as the overall deprivation is concerned, in terms of access to employment, job market, poverty, our post sachar evaluation data shows that there has been marginal improvement, but the improvement certainly is not commensurate with what the capabilities of this great, great country have, because we are talking about inclusive development, we are talking about addressing the problems of the marginalized sections of the population. For the banks, we have special assistance programs. The funds that I showed for West Bengal Muslims to be very low, that is the special funds which are to be given for vulnerable sections of the population, which have not reached. So I personally believe there is a lot that the country can do to fulfill the vision of inclusive India and certainly the rural-urban divide which exists needs to be addressed for any reason not for just Muslims alone, rural-urban divide is very, very sharp in terms of access to employment market, education market and health situation. But as far as the Muslims are concerned, certainly I am concerned about the slowing down at the low rate of rural-urban migration of the Muslims at their national level and as the official data shows even for West Bengal. Thank <laughs> you.